Welcome. Okay. Um, welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee, the second meeting of 2015. Can I ask everyone to set any electronic devices to flight mode or off, please? And I'd like to start with introductions. We are supported at the table by clerking and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. And members will also now start to introduce themselves in turn, starting on my right. And I would also like to declare an interest in any relevant information at today's meeting. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sandra White, MSP Glasgow Kelvin, Deputy Convener of the Equal Opportunity Committee. Good morning. Uh, good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning. Christian Arad, MSP North East of Scotland. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. I'm Jane Baxter, MSP for Miss Scotland and Fife, and I'd like to declare an interest in an item that's later on the agenda, convener. OK. Uh, the first agenda item today is a decision on taking business in private. You're asked to agree consideration of evidence here during your, during your work following the having and keeping a home and inquiry at item five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two is to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights on an affirmative instrument, namely the Equality Act 2010, Specifications of Public Authorities, Scotland Order 2015. This instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions may, be, may come into force. Following this evidence taken, the committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under Agenda Item 3. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his accompanying official, and can invite you, Cabinet Secre Secretary, to make any opening remarks. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. Can I introduce my official, Gaynor Davenport, from our Equalities Unit in the Scottish Government, and uh, Gaynor will uh, help me this morning uh, in answering your difficult questions when we get to that stage. Can I uh, just see one or two introductory remarks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to come this morning. I think this is my first appearance in front of the committee in my new role as the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights. And I don't yet have to declare an interest in terms of pensioners' rights before anyone asks me that. The draft order proposes to make routine amendments to the UK Equality Act 2010 in consequence of the establishment of new public bodies and office holders in Scotland. If approved, the draft affirmative order will ensure historic environment Scotland, our health and social in care integration joint boards and regional boards for colleges are subject to the public sector equality duty in the same way similar bodies and office holders are currently listed in Part 3 of Schedule 19 to the 2010 Act. The committee will be familiar with the Equality Act, which introduced the public sector equality duty, requiring listed public authorities to have due regard when exercising their functions to the need to eliminate dis discrimination, advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. It is clear that the new public authorities and office bearers carry out public functions which should be covered by the public sector equality duty and I, I will touch very briefly on those general functions. Yeah, firstly, the Joint Integrated Boards for Health and Social Care. As Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, I was delighted to introduce the landmark legislation that became the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014, not the sexiest of titles. It provides arrangements for integrating adult health and social care in order to improve outcomes for patients, service users, carers and their families. Health boards and local authorities will be required in, to enter into joint working arrangements in respect of certain of the statutory functions relating to health and social care services. Health boards and local authorities are already independently subject to the duty in the exercise of their functions, uh, so it's right that the duty is extended to the new integration joint boards to cover functions that may be delegated from health boards and local councils. Secondly, we have Historic Environment Scotland. The Historic Environment Scotland Act 2014 provides for the establishment of a new non-departmental public body, Historic Environment Scotland. This body will replace the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland, of which I am not one. 
a, a public body established by Royal Warrant and Historic Scotland, an executive agency within the Scottish Government. The 2014 Act gives Historic Environment Scotland the general function of investigating, caring for and promoting Scotland's historic environment. And thirdly, we have the regional boards for the colleges. The Post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013 amended the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005 to establish regional strategic bodies. The functions of a regional strategic, strategic body including, include funding and planning college provision in regions with more than one college of further education. There are two types of regional strategic body. The first is a college or university given regional strategic body functions. There are two such bodies, New College Lanarkshire and the University of the Highlands and Islands, and both are currently subject to the public sector equality duty through existing provision in Schedule 19. The second type of regional strategic body is known as a regional board, and there is currently one such body, the Regional Board for Glasgow Colleges. The draft order inserts a reference to regional boards into Schedule 19, which would mean that the Regional Board for Glasgow Colleges and any new regional boards that are created in the future would be subject to the public sector equality duty. Finally, I would like to assure the convener and committee that I received the required consent form uh, from the Right Honourable Nicky Morgan, MP, Minister for Women and Equalities, before laying the draft order, and I've consulted with the Equality and Human Rights Commission, who are content with our proposed consequential amendments, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Because this is a straightforward instrument, um, the members don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, agenda item two calls for the committee to formally consider and recommend approval of the motion, namely S4M1 Treble 27, that the Equal Opportunities Committee recommends that the Equality Act 2010, Specification of Public Authorities Scotland, Order 2015, be approved. Yep. Yep. I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move motion S4M1-27. I think in light of that, I'll just move it formally, convener. Thank you. The question is that motion S4M1-27, in the name of Alex Neil, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. We will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for coming along. Just and thank, thank you, you again as well. I wish every shift was as easy as that one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I'll now suspend the meeting.
Agenda item four is an evidence session on our having and keeping a home, steps to preventing homelessness amongst young people in Quire. I'd like to welcome Margaret Burgess, Minister for Housing and Welfare and her accompanying official. Can I start by asking you and your official to introduce yourself, please, and invite you, the Minister, to make any opening remarks. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here this morning with, with Marion Gibb uh, from the Homeless uh, team to talk about what the Scottish Government is doing in terms of homelessness, in particular for young people. Um, preventing homelessness wherever possible is and will remain a priority for the Scottish Government and I absolutely recognise the particular vulnerability of young people to homelessness. I provided a full written report to the committee a year ago and I have noted with interest the further evidence you received over the course of the year. In the last 12 months we have seen the further development of the housing options approach to prevention with further funding committed to the housing options hubs and publication last week of the first Prevent One statistics. We have seen further falls in homelessness amongst young people and the passing of the children in Young People Scotland Act. The next 12 months will see further significant steps, including the publication of guidance and housing options and the introduction of a private rented sector bill. Scotland has strong progressive homelessness legislation, but I believe it's important to focus on what homelessness means to people as individuals, and of course, that includes young people. It's clear that the housing options approach has led to welcome reductions in homelessness numbers, but perhaps more importantly, it has led to a person-centred principle being instilled at the heart of delivering, delivering homelessness services across Scotland. The current development of national guidance and housing options will need to reflect the needs of young people if we are to see continuous improvements in this area. In the past year, we have already seen the specific needs of young people highlighted in, revi in revised guidance for the housing su support duty. and These issues are also informing the revision of guidance for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Housing options has also led to the development of mediation services to address the key issue of relationship breakdown, which still remains the most likely reason for homelessness amongst young people. We have acknowledged the importance of this by committing funding to the Scottish Centre for Con Conflict Resolution for a further year. And of course, mediation will not be appropriate for everybody. We know that needs flexible. We know that we need flexible responses to particular needs such as those of young people with a history of care. We have an opportunity to address this in the coming period through the provisions of the Children and Young Person People Act. Homelessness officials will contribute to guidance on this and I will ensure that any points raised by this committee inform that contribution. And I am pleased that alongside this inquiry, the committee has recently launched an inquiry into social isolation because it is clear that there are strong links and that's why the Scottish Government is continuing to fund a national coordinator on rebuilding social networks for homeless people through the Housing Voluntary Grant Scheme, alongside other national coordinators that we fund. Mediating conflict, developing life skills, use of temporary accommodation and housing education are just some of the areas that can have an impact on homelessness amongst young people. And the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, in which I sit as Minister, has young people and homelessness on its agenda as a standing item. In light of the range of issues involved, this allows us to make links to important policy developments such as health and social care integration or the proposed publication of a national missing persons strategy due later this year. And we look to make progress against the background of welfare reform, which is affecting young people. But progress needs to be underpinned by adequate housing supply, and I'm pleased that we're on track to meet our affordable housing targets of to deliver 30,000 additional affordable homes by March 2016, and within that, 20,000 for social rent. And finally, convener, we know that homelessness can be profoundly damaging to those starting out in life, and the effects may last for years. But with a strong foundation of rights for young homeless people already established, I am confident that we can continue to make progress working with local authorities, their partners and young people themselves to prevent homelessness and improve outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will start 
by asking the first question. Um, the 2012 commitment in, in housing support duty has been positively received in general, but there are some remaining concerns for young people and in particular care leavers. Uh, during the evidence taken, the committee heard concerns about the use of intentionally criteria. And the Citizens Advice Scotland also raised this point in evidence to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, who recommended in the report that the Scottish Government investigate and report on the reasons why the number of those who are made intentionally homeless has risen and whether the Government intends to take any action to encourage greater consistency. Could you actually tell us how the Scottish Government actually monitors the number of people being classed as intentionally homeless? Well, intentionally homelessness um, assessment is carried out by each local authority and they send their, their returns to the Scottish Government and that's done on a very regular basis and it's part of the standard um, statistical data collection that, that we take. Um, but I think what I would say here, I think it is important to highlight that the numbers of as assessed as intentionally homeless are still low in comparison to, to it's about one in 20 applications are assessed as intentionally homeless but that in itself doesn't mean that there is no services provided um, intentionally if someone's assessed as intentionally homeless they are provided with advice and support and temporary accommodation and the outcomes in about a third of the, the cases do result in settled accommodation where the local authority still has contact, if the, if the, the person still maintains contact with the local authority. Um, we're currently in discussion with local authorities about you know, any increases, although it is small uh, in terms of intentionality and to check it's consistent in how they record it. But also feedback from local authorities are telling us that with the priority need test being removed, uh, that test, in some instances before, then it wouldn't go on to look at the intentionality because the priority need wasn't satisfied. So therefore, that could be increasing the numbers, but it is something that we're looking at. But, but you know, I really do think we have to stress the numbers are small in intentionality and it doesn't mean no services are provided, but it is something that we're in discussion with local authorities about and we will look at and with the statistical monitoring group as well is something that they will review to ensure that they're consistently recorded in the same way. If there is an increase, then that needs to be looked at as well, but intentionality uh, is a very small proportion. Okay, thank you very much, and um, I'll pass you on now to John Mason. Thank you. Um, the, I mean, we, we heard, I think, mixed evidence. We, we had some young people at the committee and who had been in care, and <laughs> some of them had gone on to, good, you know, had a good experience. And I think there was quite a lot of positive comment about the fact that they could return up to the age of twenty-one now, um, which wasn't the case, and that, that, that seemed pretty positive. However, I did get the impression that. You know, we were seeing some of the more able young people who were quite able to really fight their corner, had good support from other organisations. And I just wonder uh, what your feeling is about just the general picture for young people leaving care and whether you feel there's room <coughs> for improvement in there. I mean, the first thing I would say is that in, in anything, anywhere, there's always room for improvement. And I'm not going to sit here and say everything's absolutely um, sorted. But in terms of the, the picture for young care, I think it is improving for people leaving care. I think the Children and Young Person Act that you referred to, um, in terms of young people up to age 21, the Scottish Government has put £5 million a year in to allow young people up to age of 21 to stay in foster care, kinship care or residential care, and also providing that additional support to age 26 uh, if they require additional support and some element of of their, their life or in getting housing. But I do think we're building good relationships between the Scottish Welfare Fund and housing departments and housing options services because it shouldn't be that young people leaving care should necessarily be presenting as homelessness. The housing options approach, if the if the coordination is, is, is there, which is, is coming together, then there should be a planned program into settled accommodation without necessarily having to go through the homeless route. So I think, and, and also that is working with the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that the 
items that someone requires in their home to set up a home uh, is there, is in place as well. So there's very good examples of practice of that going on and what we want to do is make sure that that improves and is also consistent across the country. I mean, I think th th there was a feeling that some of the young people in care, you know, they actually did very little for themselves, traditionally at least, and, you know, even in, well, I suppose that varies amongst young kids in a, in a family, that some do the washing, some don't, some do the ironing, some don't, some cook, some don't. And But there was, there certainly had been a tradition that a lot of young people, so it was a big jump for them to be entirely on their own. And I think there was a feeling that maybe, you know, there was some kind of support needed as, the, as they moved on. That support is, is that, that's the kind of interim support and that's very often provided. There are many young people in care are now getting support from third sector organisations as well on the very issues that you talk about. I've visited projects where young people are you know, learning to actually go out and do the shopping, come in, cook it, and when they leave the table, they have to, the dishes don't miraculously get washed, that they have to participate in that. And, and young people actually find that, you know, it's, a challenge to start with, but they, they, they get really into that. Some of the one, the projects I've visited and see them getting really getting into how they're doing it and the pride they take in being able to do that. It's a skill that many would take for granted, but they now feel is something that is going to help them as they move on in life. So they need those kind of skills as well as employability support because employability is very important as well for young people. So there's a whole range of things that yes. has to come together to get it right. OK, and I mean, kind of linked in with that, then the, the next question was about, you know, the housing options. And uh, I think one suggestion was maybe there were ha not all the staff who were dealing with young people were aware of all the housing options and maybe there was a need for training in that area. Uh, I don't know if that, that's something you've picked up or you, you could comment on. In, in terms of the housing options hubs that the Scottish Government funds, um, they meet regularly to discuss training and sharing of good practice. And currently the, the guidance has been um, revamped or been produced, a, a new guidance manual as well on housing options. But all of those approaches have to be taken into account. And that is the whole um, purpose of housing options, is to ensure that those delivering the service know all of the options available in their area. And if it's something that can't be provided from within the local authority, then the third sector partners can provide that service. So that's very much part of it. And I think that the, the quarterly meetings with the hubs where the practitioners can get together and discuss these things and sharing practice and experience is helping. Um, the housing options is still fairly new, but we recognise that, and that was one of the issues I think that the regulator um, in the thematic inquiry looked at was the, the training needs of the housing options, and that's been taken on board, and certainly that will form part of the, the, the new guidance. OK, thanks. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Jane, I don't know if you want Thanks, to Thanks, yeah. just, just a, a following on from what John said, Morning Minister. Um, you mentioned guidance and you mentioned the importance of, of consistency and I absolutely agree with you, but I wonder, um, will that guidance, um, this, uh, how um, mandatory will it be? It's almost a contradiction. Is it guidance or, or is it going to be um, made clear to local authorities that this is very important. Uh, how, how are we going to achieve consistency across Scotland? And what about the use of enhanced housing options? Is that going to be rolled out across Scotland too? I think the first thing I would say in terms of the guidance and the hubs, there is a great will within the, the, those working in the housing option hubs to provide the best service possible for people that present as homeless and also to make sure that people are getting the services that are there. And that's why the, the meetings, the guidance... Is, it is guidance, it is, but it's what we would anticipate that they will all use. It's agreed, and it's agreed across the board. Um, the, the regulator will look at that as well when the regulator is, is uh, looking at homeless services, how much have attention has been paid to the guidance in terms of housing options. So we, would anti we don't anticipate a problem with that. I think it's getting it right and getting it then consistent and where there are any inconsistencies if there are then if they come back to the quarterly meeting where people are getting together from across the country to look at it and discuss the pra and it, it would follow on to the enhanced services that you're talking about housing options is a continuous thing and it's about continuous improvement and it's about innovation so where something is happening that's good 
then that can be looked at. And some things will be good in one area and it might not be the right thing for another area. So there has to be that flexibility built into any system as well. But what we're saying is if there's something that's happening that's good, that's giving good outcomes and good outcomes to homeless people and good outcomes to young homeless people, then that's something we would want to see developed in, in other areas. And certainly I would want to see that and if it wasn't happening. You know, I'd be saying, well, well, why? If this can happen here and it's got these outcomes and it's not happening here, and it would fit in with this area, well, you know, there'd be questions asked there. We'd want that to happen. OK, thanks. That's yeah. very helpful. Can I just come in on that? We've actually heard that the housing options are limited because of the housing stock. Can you give me more information on how the Scottish Government will actually address the lack of suitable housing? As I said in my initial uh, remarks, the Scottish Government does have a, a target of 30,000 affordable homes by the lifetime of this Parliament, uh, 20,000 of which are for social rent. We've also ended the right to buy. We have brought, introduced regulation into the private sector to make the private sector an option as well for people, because it's the right option for some people. Um, we're looking at building houses and scale, looking at getting finance to build houses and scale in the private sector. We've funded a a private sector rented champion to try and grow the private sector. We're looking at a new tenants in the private sector to give more protection for tenants, tenants in the private sector. Um, so everything we, we're doing everything we can with the resources we have. We are building more houses than any previous uh, for affordable rent than any previous administration in the government. We know we, we need to get more houses built and we're trying to get them in scale using the money we have to attract even more money and the best investment. And we've got several examples of how we can do that. National Housing Trust, which really, you know, people might move out from a social rented house into a National Housing Trust or into one of our lift schemes, which leaves that house available um, for someone else. So we're doing everything we can. We absolutely recognise that supply is part of, you have to have the supply to give people the houses. So that is recognised. But we do, we believe we're doing everything we can with the funding available. Thank you. John? Yeah, Thanks. Um, I mean, one of the things shelter raised, and as you mentioned yourself, uh, isolation is something we're going to be looking at in our next study. And, and obviously there's an overlap here uh, because some young people, as we, not just coming out of care, but in, in various situations find, do find themselves isolated. And then the suggestion is, well, what about shared tenancies? Uh, is that a way forward? And I suppose, well, the obvious one is that it, it helps deal with isolation, but it also helps young people share costs. And so there's, there could be advantages in that. I mean, what, what's your view on the whole concept of shared tenancies? Well, I, I mean, I think what, what I would say, there's no one size fit, fits all approach in any of this. There's a range of options. And there's a number of organisations funded by the Scottish Government and some that are not funded by the Scottish Government that are looking at shared tenancies. And it's, it is a solution for some people. And I, I visited one project in particular in Fife where the young people were, um, they had been homeless. They had gone to the project where they've given accommodation, but the, the idea of the project is to try and match people together to see if they can get on together if they would be able to take on a shared tenancy and uh, the, you know they, they just get to it's about getting to know each other how will they go on because it's not you can't just say you two you two you two uh, that's your house your house you, you have to ensure that they can get on work together and um, you know what one's good at can one cook and one wash up and so that that I found that a really interesting project, and there's been several other projects I've visited about shared tenancies. And it's also good that if you get that sort of start into it from one of the the organisations, that if it's not working and there's people that can't go on, that decision's made before they're in the house and back down the road again. It's not working. So yes, shared tenancies, I think is a way forward for, for a number of people and for a variety of reasons, but the isolation should never be uh, ignored in terms of young people being isolated um, in a home that can cause as many problems as other things if they don't have those social networks. And that's why we fund Social Network Coordinator as well. There's an absolute recognition that this happens. And I think the Rock Trust... Is it Mary, yes. you tell me the Rock Trust move? It's a rock trust that, um, that has the national coordinator about um, social networks 
um, to try to like develop that, that area, particularly to do, we, that's been funded for a number of years now. Um, but it is about that recognition of the fact that it's not just about giving somebody a tenancy. There's an awful lot more connected with that to make sure that it's sustainable. I mean, you've actually kind of answered some of the points I was going to follow up on, but I'll make them anyway because I certainly had a constituent, a young constituent, who you know he was he was a student and he was he couldn't stay with the family, but he still had a good relationship with the family. But he got put in with somebody who just had a totally chaotic kind of life, and then they couldn't agree about paying the electricity or anything. And he seemed to you know it was quite difficult for him to get to change who he was sharing with. He still was happy to share with somebody. And, you know, then I had to get involved and it just seemed, you know, unfortunate or it shouldn't be necessary that the MSP has to get involved in a young person getting a better tenancy. Um, and it, eventually it did get worked out in his case. And I mean, I was thinking back myself, I think I, sh I always shared accommodation since when I left home from when I was 21 till I was about 33. Uh, and that used to be quite common, although maybe that's changing a bit now. Um, but it's certainly something I think is, is certainly worth looking at and I appreciate your comments do you think it's something we can improve on as well, that we could move forward? Maybe some landlords could be a bit more flexible than others? I mean, I, I, well, I, I think it's something we, we can look at and improve on, I think, yes. But I, I think the points that we have to recognise, and that's why I think it's good that there's the, the, the support project to start with, to move, because a lot of these people have other issues and problems as well we have to recognise and it's not just straightforward by putting people into shared tenancies it's about giving them that opportunity beforehand and it, it can take two, three months in some instances longer to say well yes they could share a tenancy and also have systems in place that if that, even it might work out to start with but you know we, we all know something might look good from one side of the fence and when you get to the other side of the fence it's not as easy or as, as simple as we thought it was that there could be opportunities at looking how can these be arranged but you still have to have people that want to, to give it a go want to try it together and can work with each other um, and are happy with, with that rather be, my one thing I would say is that there should be no forced shared tenancies that it has to be something that people want to do and that they've had that opportunity understand what's involved it's not always that easy sharing although somebody want, doesn't want to live alone it's not always that easy sharing and it's about compromise and all of that so these kind of skills and uh, introductory projects I think are excellent to, to iron out those difficulties before the tenants is actually signed up to Thank you. And the final area I was to touch on um, was about data collection on homelessness, a slightly different subject. Um, I mean, again, my impression is, and, and I think we got the idea that, you know, maybe there is a bit of inconsistency and um, c can the Scottish Government encourage or establish <laughs> improved data collection, especially by councils, I think. I mean, it's, it's specifically, I had an example where somebody came to me, I think you actually met this person yourself, who felt that people who were sofa surfing and wouldn't tell the council, in this case Glasgow, where they had been staying were then being left out of the statistics because they wouldn't fill in all the, the boxes. Well, I, I mean, I'll maybe ask Marion to come in a bit in the statistics, but the statistics in homelessness have, have been mandatory for some considerable time and they are relatively consistent across local authority areas. And we've recently introduced the new statistic, Pre Pre Prevent One, which is about the options that people are and choices that people are, are given and, and the outcomes um, for people who present as homeless. And we also have the Scottish Government statisticians meet regularly with the those that use, you know, within local authorities that input the data and collect the data. Um, they work and meet regularly together to ensure that everybody's operating and doing you know, putting the correct information in and doing it effectively. In terms of the, the sofa suffering bit, they, they wouldn't necessarily, and, and I'll ask Marion to come in here, be left out of the statistic. They would still present it down as, as homeless. I think there was loads of other issues in the particular uh, case you, men you mentioned. Um, but, I mean, I think that the statistics are fairly, fairly accurate, fairly good. We're looking at improving the statistics or, or discussing with the housing uh, chief housing officers whether or not another mandatory field should be added to 
that can tell us the length of time that people are in, placed in temporary accommodation. So that's one area we're looking at the statistics. But Marion, do you maybe want to say a bit more about the sofa suffering? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Minister. Um, I think it's important to, to note that if somebody's made a presentation as homeless, they should feature in the statistics, um, irrespective of what happens to their case subsequently. Um, and I, I'm aware of the case you're referring to, uh, and I know that the Minister as well knows that one and the sort of complexities around that one. Um, so so there, is, there is a point, if somebody's made a presentation, they should feature in the statistics. That's not saying that 100% will, will get there, because that you know s systems work... Um, in different ways, in different places, but it is um, there. I think that, the, the just to back up what the Minister was saying there, I think that around homelessness, we've got a very comprehensive statistical sort of collection there, which means that we can find an awful lot about, out about homeless people in Scotland, which is, is um, a real benefit when we're looking to sort of develop sort of um, interventions and things like that as well, particularly around prevention, when we can look at, you know, what are the presenting reasons for homelessness and therefore what can we do to try to move that on. And I think the key thing that we've actually introduced, which was the regulator had picked up as a gap in the statistical collection for a while, was with the move to housing options. If people are not making a homelessness application, they're not going to feature in the homelessness statistics. So with the new collection that we've got, which is called Prevent One, um, is about collecting the information around what's happened around housing options. So we can see, and we can also trace them and see whether or not that becomes a homelessness application at some point or whether it's actually a preventable case that comes through and won't feature there. So we're be beginning to build up a, a, a very comprehensive picture of not just the homelessness bit, which has been there for over 10 years, but also around the housing options um, sort of like activity around local authorities. And I think that's really useful. The first publication of that was the first six months, and that came out in January this year. Um, so I think that we're, you know, and obviously it's just the first first sort of publication that we've got, so we can't give too much, you know, on that as well. It needs, it's expe I think you call it experimental statistics at this stage, that's what statisticians call us, call it. And But we'll be able to then sort of, like, trace trends and see whether whether we need to actually, like, try to focus our activity and things like that. So I think we're at, we've, we've got an awful lot of good material there, and we're now adapting for the, the new sort of world that we're working in around housing options. So I think we're being able to build, build up that majorly comprehensive picture. Thank you. Thanks, Jo. Thank you. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Minister. You mentioned your opening remarks about uh, the welfare reform and how this has a, an effect. And basically, obviously, with the bedroom tax and there's the changes in the accommodation allowance from 25-year-old to 35-year-olds. Uh, I just wondered, uh, you know, what the government is doing regarding mitigating uh, these uh, effects on young homeless people in regards to particularly the bedroom tax, being able to get accommodation. And one of the other issues which was raised uh, in reports by, particularly by uh, Citizen Advice Scotland, was just how much young people had to go through to find out what benefits were available to them. I think, well, I'll maybe start with that, that last point first in terms of the benefits that are available. I think, you know, young people or any um, person at all find themselves having to get into the benefit system. It is quite a maze for anybody, and young people in particular, um, who, who are not perhaps experienced it before, it can be extremely difficult. And that's points that we've made because... Clearly, the benefit system at the moment still remains reserved. So what we can do is ensure that people, young people, are getting that service provided and some of the projects that deal with the young young homeless people in particular, that's, what, that's a part of what they're doing, is getting that person into the, the benefit system, helping them make their applications, ensuring that they're getting everything they're t entitled to. So, so that, that's one part of it. We also know that young people are disproportionately sanctioned in terms of you know, the number of young people that receive sanctioned is over 40%, whereas um, it's, but they're, they're, they form 20% of the GSA claimants. So there's more young people disproportionately sanctioned, and we're aware of that. And I think you know, we, we changed our guidance in the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that people uh, being sanctioned from benefits weren't excluded from the Scottish Welfare Fund. In terms of <coughs> the mitigation work, we have mitigated the, the, the bedroom tax for the social sector and we have mitigated that fully uh, and continue to do so. Within the, the shared accommodation allowance, what we 
want to do is make sure that young people know what is available when they take on a property, how, you know, how much housing benefit they would be entitled to. If could, they can still claim discretionary housing payments, um, which is not connected to the bedroom tax, discretionary housing payment cover a number of things, and, and that being one of them as well. So it would be showing people, or assisting people, how they can get through that. So there's a number of things that we can do, but we've got to bear in mind that there's a limit because welfare is still reserved. So it's about helping and supporting people to get what they're entitled to, um, supporting people to get their application forms in, challenge the sanctions if, if we can, make sure they've got access to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So I think that that's what we're, we're currently doing. And as we take on any new powers, then we can look at what more support we can give to, to young people, particularly employability, because we all want to see young people having a, a future and a bright future and able to access employment. I mean, it seems to be that it's sort of a, like it's a double whammy. Obviously, you've got the bedroom tax, obviously the lack of uh, one bedroom flats, and then the change in, in the, you know the accommodation age, which obviously hits the, the twenty-five year olds. So I thank you for you know your, your reply in regarding the discretionary housing payments. There's another aspect of an knock-on effect as well that uh, getting young people into education and obviously into employment also. And some uh, comments have came from South Lanarkshire Council and, and, and others as well in regards to, you know, the, the, the education allowance. Uh, they were saying that perhaps if you could look at that to give young people more monies uh, in regards to not having to apply for discretionary housing payments. And what's your thoughts on that particular one, Minister? I, I'm not quite sure from, from what angle they're talking about is more money and not discretionary housing payments because if someone's in receipt of housing benefit, then it depends on how much income they have. So if they have more money, they have more income. So I'm not sure. I'm, I'm maybe missing the point that the, 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 the council was making there. And also, in some instances, if somebody's a student in full-time education, then the, the housing benefit rules... They're not, they're not eligible for necessarily for, for housing benefit. So what we do, I mean, we want to make sure that people get, when they're in school and eligible, the educational maintenance allowance. We want to make sure that young people, if they go to college and are eligible for a bursary, that, that should be able to, they should be able to claim that easily because at the colleges they, they would be eligible for a bursary. And I know it's not my field, but I think it's up to £93 a week. Um, they, they can claim a bursary. If there's a difficulty with people accessing those, then I think that's something we can certainly take back and look at and discuss within the, the housing options team to say that if it's coming back to us that people who are presenting as homeless and are not are wanting to go to college and are not finding it easy to access the grants and, and that are available, then certainly that's something we'd look at. A number of the projects I visited, that's one of the facts. The last project I visited, that's what the project worker and, and the young person were doing. They were going through the, the bursary application, making sure the application forms are filled in and all the benefits. But I accept that not every young person has got, you know, is in a project getting that support. So it's certainly something, we, you know, we can certainly look at and we can also discuss with our education colleagues if there is an issue of people accessing the, the funding that's available. Uh, th thank you, Minister. I understand it's not part of your brief, the education one, but it did come up in, in replies uh, in regard to the EMA uh, system. You mentioned the fact about sharing information, and we know that uh, you know the community care grant, which is now part of the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, there has been some concerns that the information has not been shared across the board. Uh, is there any way, or do you think there can be improvements made in the sharing of information in regards to you know, the Scottish Welfare Fund and applying to younger people as well? My, my view is that there's always you can always improve everything, and if there's good practice there, there's something happening or not happening, then we can look at it and see what's happening. I think there have been improvements in the Scottish Welfare Fund from, from the... It, you know, since it was introduced, the improvements are there. We can certainly look at it as something that has come up at the, the practitioners' working group, and we have the COSLA development worker, who the Scottish Government funds, uh, is funded through the Scottish Welfare Fund, to uh, talk to local authorities, to talk to practitioners, and to share that that best practice and make sure that young people are accessing the fund. But I think on, on looking at it in terms of young homeless people uh, in the last eighteen months. 
Certainly the, the figures are showing that at least a thousand young homeless people have had community care grants specifically in relation to a new tenancy. There's more had community care grants but in, uh, and in also crisis grants, but specifically in relation to, to a new tenancy, over, over a thousand young people have had a, a community care grant. And we want to encourage that. And also, you know, the, the, the working relationships between the housing options teams, the homeless teams, and the Scottish Welfare Fund team to ensure it kind of it can be seamless because an application can be made eight weeks prior to the, the date of the tenancy. So there's an opportunity to get the the goods or whatever's required ready for the the young person moving into their tenancy. So we are improving that and we're working towards that because that that to me is the way it should work. You know that those kind of. Um, communication networks within a local authority area should be able to deliver a service like that. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, um, Jane. Convener. Um, Minister, I'd like to return to the Children and Young People's Act briefly. Um, part 9 of the Act um, is about corporate parenting and it ensures all corporate parents, including housing departments, understand the needs of looked after young people and care leavers. And I'd like to ask if you're aware of, of, of what's been happening about in taking forward Part 9 in terms of the implementation of the Act um, to date and also what's planned in the future. I, I, in, in general terms is what I can say about the, the, the Children and Young Persons Act. Um, I think what we're doing in terms of a government is looking at uh, developing a, a model for child impact assessments across all government portfolios, which means that any policy decision we're taking, the needs of a child will have to be considered in doing that. And that's in general terms. In terms of the part 20 you referred to, I can certainly take that back to uh, and, and provide that to committee in writing once I've contacted the Minister for Children and Young People. Can I just ask a supplementary convener? I've always been interested in the role of GERFEC, and I really appreciate that's not in your brief, but it, I've often thought that housing should be um, play a much bigger part in, in, in GERFEC because when GERFEC groups sit down locally, it's getting it right for every child. Um, they don't seem to include housing, so they talk about all other aspects of, of, a, of a child's life and a child's circumstances. And housing, in my view, isn't always... Um, sufficiently appreciated or accommodated in, within that GERFIC framework. So it's just um, my opinion, um, but I wonder if, if there's any ideas about whether the need for a safe, sustainable home could be made more important in the context of, of GERFIC. I think in part of the whole prevention approach, uh, which fits into GERFIC to make sure that every child's got the best, the best start in life uh, and is ready to, uh, in education and every other aspect to, to join the adult world. So I do think there's a number of things that that housing can be brought into there. And I also think that the named person is also very you know, useful in that respect. If there's somebody there who can identify that there's an issue with a child, whether it be homelessness or housing situation, that can be dealt with at a very early stage. So I do think, I mean, I, I don't think there's many aspects of anyone's life that housing doesn't pay, play a central role in because there's nothing, you know, as you say, a warm, sustainable home, that security, and, and yes, it is absolutely critical. And I do think the Children and Young per uh, Persons uh, Act will, Young People Act, will help with that. And if, if there's, you know, I can certainly discuss it also with um, the Minister for Children and Young People if there's anything else we can put in to just make that more prominent. But certainly there are packs being produced for schools as well about housing and, you know, from an early age, you know, what, what, what do you expect, what do, what do children expect as well from a home? So I think there is more we can do there, and we can certainly look at that, but I do think um, getting it right for every child, if the house is not right, then it hasn't happened. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Kavina. You. Thank you very much. Um, John Finney. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, Minister. <clears throat> Minister, if I noted you correctly earlier, um, you said uh, mediation is a key issue in relationship breakdown. And now acknowledging the financial climate that everyone's operating in, can you comment on how uh, the challenges faced by the statutory and third sectors in delivering um, services, particularly yeah. like mediation? I think, and I well, suppose the priority you would wish placed on it, please. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a priority placed in mediation, and, and that's why we've, through the third sector early intervention fund, we've given further, extended the funding to the, um, for the 
is it Cyrenians? Uh, yes. For the, the last time I said Cyrenians, <laughs> Sandra White thought I was talking about Syrians, so I'll try and pronounce <laughs> it properly. The Cyrenians, um, we fund them for the Scottish Conflict Resolution Centre to look at that, and that's, that's, that's the kind of model that we're going to um, and hopefully learn from and see how we can further develop that in terms of mediation. But there's also a number of other organisations that get funding through the, the, the Housing Voluntary Grant Fund and other services from the Scottish Government that look at mediation as well. So there are, pre I mean, I absolutely understand that there are pressures, there's pressures on all uh, publicly funded organisations and third sector that depend on uh, public funding. However, we are still, we, we didn't cut any of the funding to the in terms of our housing voluntary grant fund, that fund remained the same. We didn't uh, introduce any cuts in that. It's still 2.3 million pounds, I think, uh, this year. And last year, we, did, we didn't uh, impose any cuts because we recognise the valuable work that they're contributing. And also, we will learn from the project that we're funding through the Cyrenians. And hopefully, that we we then have to look at overall how how much can we roll this out further? But it is a national conflict for resolution centre, and that's where we're going to learn um, from how that works. Thank you. That's reassuring. How via all these things can you ensure that young people will have access to high quality mediation, then, Minister? I think that that's part of the housing options approach, and it's part of very much the training that housing you know professionals uh, who work with the housing options teams are looking at is when. Um, mediation it's part of the code as well it, you know is mediation appropriate in these circumstances and if so we need to ensure that they get trained mediators it's not this is not you know they need to go to get, or have people trained to deliver that service um, and that that's what we're looking at and certainly I haven't had any feedback that that's not happening. If there was examples where it's not happening, that people are not getting access to mediation or are not getting access to, to trained mediate, or mediators that are being sent to are not uh, properly trained or skilled, then that's something I would certainly take on board, but I've had no indication that that is the case. I, I know from a previous time as a, a counsellor particularly that mediation is quite often offered to people when it's wholly inappropriate? Is the guidance being prepared? Because I think you acknowledged yourself it will not always be appropriate to seek mediation. The guidance is quite clear that, that, that you know, mediation is not appropriate for everybody. There are circumstances that will be very obvious that mediation is not appropriate. Um, and there will be other circumstances where it's got to be looked at and discussed with the, the, the young person themselves because they've got to agree, you know, to, to do this, mediation is always a, a two-way thing. It's not something you can force on someone. Um, but the, the guidance and the training is getting what's the word? racked up in that as well to ensure that absolutely that when mediation is discussed or offered, it is appropriate. Okay, it's, thank not, you. it's not for every case, and, and we accept that. OK, that's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christian? Alan, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Hi, uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, yes, a uh, free question. One uh, we had from the city council uh, who mentioned as uh, the use of befriendies and volunteers, and particularly they said that uh, they are using them uh, not to replace paid offices, but to work along paid offices, uh, to go along with clients to appointments, some someone to chat with. I just wanted to know. Uh, what does Scottish Government uh, think about this kind of approach? Well, my view in that has, has my view has always been that there's there's always a role um, in anywhere for, for for volunteers if they absolutely understand, you know, if it's clear what the role is and it's not taking over a function that should be provided by uh, the local authority or another organisation. But in some instances, a befriender. I mean, and I've also seen a number of projects. Uh, visited projects where people are, are trained to, to be befrienders and matched with someone to go with them to, and sometimes it's just a whole handing thing we talked about isolation company some people just don't have the the confidence to go in somewhere themselves and, and, and present themselves to claim a benefit and I think that with anything I, I wouldn't rule anything out if it's going to assist a young person or someone just get that 
further step, even if it's just a small step, if that that can help, then why why would I consider ruling that out? Um, I, I would favour anything that helps someone to get along the route, but I'm not suggesting that it should all be done just by simply uh, you know, using volunteers. And, and I have a great respect for any volunteer, uh, you know, who have a background in the voluntary sector and just know the skills, training and dedication there is among people who volunteer and to, even to, to volunteers a befriender as well. It's not just straightforward. You know, there would be training involved and lots of things to go through to do that. But I do think there's a, there's a place for that as well within the, the whole... Uh, helping young people back into uh, just to get on, just move on a wee step. And it's looked like it's patchy uh, uh, compared to other uh, other local authorities. And the idea of Dundee uh, City Council is that uh, the third sector and the paid officer are not working in silos, but are really working in partnership together, in action together. Would you favour this kind of approach for? Yeah, I think a partnership approach always works better, and I think any partnership between the third sector, local authority, and the service user um, will always have a better outcome. And I think in, in terms of partnership, yes. I, I absolutely would support that. Thank you, Minister. Regarding uh, housing option, we heard a lot uh, <laughs> from uh, in our evidence regarding inappropriate temporary accommodation and particularly uh, bed and breakfast. And uh, we heard a lot of evidence about it, about uh, people living in it and, and if it's uh, uh, something should be acceptable or not. We heard, for example, uh, from Who Care Scotland, uh, uh, saying that uh, older people are in bed and breakfast, older men or older women, and uh, it's not appropriate for, for young homeless people uh, to be in that kind of, uh, of, of, of surrounding. And you said uh, we should not be forced uh, a shared tenancy uh, up, upon young people uh, earlier on. So it's a kind of shared tenancy when you think about it, uh, bed and breakfast. I, locally, myself, I checked with Aberdeenshire Council and, and I was surprised to know that even if they reduced the numbers in the last financial years, we had as many 165 uh, people aged 24 under uh, uh, sometimes in, in, in bed and breakfast accommodation. So what, what's your view? Should bed and breakfast be, be uh, still a housing option or uh, for young homeless people? And... Uh, uh, what, what, what can we do to ensure that, uh, that young people uh, uh, are not placed in inappropriate temporary accommodation? I mean, in, in terms of placing anyone in accommodation, it's up to the local authority to look at what accommodation is available in their area and to look at the suitability of that accommodation for the person that they're um, housing. So, you know, that, that's the first thing I would say the local authority has to, to make that decision. But nobody should get and be should be placed in inappropriate accommodation or accommodation. Now I, I can't sit here and say that every single bed and breakfast accommodation is inappropriate if the local authority, you know, has a capacity with their, their their other temporary accommodation at a particular point. But what what I would say is that accommodation should be appropriate to the needs of the individual, and that's the whole housing options approach, is looking at the individual and what would be appropriate for their needs and for how long. And I think that's when Marion talked earlier, we'll, we'll, we'll have a better understanding maybe of how long people have been placed in, in temporary accommodation. So what might be suitable for a very short period of time would not be something that's suitable for a longer period of time. And, and what I would also say, if there, there are young people in bed and breakfast accommodation, then, you know, I don't know if it was checked what support they're still being provided with because young people would still be requiring support, whether it be support for um, social networks, whether it's support to claim benefits, whether it's support. So that support should still be with them uh, in, in the accommodation if that's been identified as a, if that person's been identified as someone who requires support because there is a duty in local authorities, a legal duty to provide support uh, for people that it's deemed you know, necessary and appropriate and most young people would come into that category. Yeah, thanks, Minister. For the, the evidence received on both counts on, on, uh, it's not suitable because of the people living already in bed and breakfast, all the people in it, but as well, uh, as you said, uh, there is no support at all in, in bed and breakfast accommodation and all the soft skill, etc. That kind of support doesn't exist at all. So the evidence we took was quite strong on this. It certainly suggests that 
folk wouldn't necessarily be in the place, place at someone's house, but they would still be c connected or matched up with a support agency in their area if they had been identified as requiring support. Thank you, Mr. Last question. I will go back to what Jen Baxter was talking about, about the, uh, uh, the get it right for every child and how, I know it's, it's not uh, your limit, but how much uh, it can help uh, the, the, uh, the young homeless people. And, and we heard again in, in, in evidence uh, that uh, uh, the care uh, 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 inspectorate said that while uh, GFEC uh, provides a strong emphasis on early intervention, a number of services that help to prevent young people becoming homeless often come under adult supervision. So. And I'm quite happy to hear that you're going to speak uh, with the minister uh, uh, for uh, for young pe younger people. But there is there is a problem where I think we the evidence is showing is that GFEC, even if it's recognised by everybody who came to give evidence as, as an opportunity, there were no really proof of how it helped younger people who ended up homeless. I think I would go back to some of the remarks when Jane Baxter referred to Gerfecht, that in terms of now with the Children and Young People's Act um, and the additional responsibilities put on to corporate parents and, and local authorities and also by the, the named person being able to provide that, get that more holistic assessment of children which bring together, you know, all of their needs and includes, you know, education, housing, public health uh, and what kind of support is required and to ensure that those supporting agencies follow that young person uh, as they, long as that person requires that support. So I do think that there are changes that have come in and also with the Scottish Government um, looking at doing a, a child impact assessment across all uh, parts of government, I think that will help to ensure that we do get it right for every child. You agree, but it's a bit too early. To, to, uh, to At this stage, um, in terms of the Children and Young People's Act, yes, we're just moving there. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, does members have any further questions they'd like to ask? No. 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 I'd like to thank the Minister for Housing for coming along today and asking our questions. And um, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 19th of February. And I'll now suspend the meeting for the committee to move into a private session. Thank you, Minister, again. Thank you.